to thank you guys this morning. You know, what happens with Integrity Church can only happen because everybody works together. From the worship team to the ushers, the greeters, the outreach teams, the teachers. It, it, it's a beautiful thing to see the body of Christ in action. And I never want to lose this. And this is, this is one of the things that are really important. Um, and, and I'm going to go over it this morning because uh, I've seen sometimes where people did godly things but God wasn't the primary motivation. And I would never want to see uh, something be done that's good, but God not be the primary motivation. I want us to always keep, and it's tough because we live in a world where our senses, are, we're trained to see things through our senses. But let me give you an example. It's a beautiful thing to give a bag of food to a person that is in need. It's a beautiful thing to go visit somebody in the hospital and to spend time with them and talk with them. It's a beautiful thing to, to teach somebody life skills. It's a beautiful thing to bring somebody into a, a safe environment. But this is, those are beautiful things, but the most beautiful thing is doing it out of a reverence and awe for God, that people would see your excitement, that they would see your awe and your wonder of God, and that that would be translated. All of those other things are vehicles to introduce people to God. And that, that's our primary motivation, and that, that was Jesus' primary motivation here upon the face of the earth. So as we do that, let, let us continue to do that in a holy reverence for the Lord. Let us continue to do the things that we do as an act of worship. I remember one man, many years ago, I was walking by, and there was some people that they were tasked to do certain things in the church, and I was one of them. I was one of the people that was asked to, to clean the, the bathrooms of the church for like a year, and there was a lot of bathrooms in this church. I was like, wow, there's a lot of bathrooms. I went to the church. I asked me, what, how can I help? Uh, how can I help? And they said, well, you know what? We need help with the bathrooms. Can you clean the bathrooms every before every Sunday before service and before services? I said, hey, if that's what you need, that's what I'll do. So I did that faithfully. But you know what? There was times where I was like, well, you know what? I did it. I, I did it because I was told. But then one day I saw this man. And he was there and he was singing. And he was worshiping as he's going around cleaning the bathroom. And he's cleaning the toilet. And I stopped in there. I was like, what's going on? Is it the worship leader? Is it... Is it, the, is it the person who is, uh, is it one of the pastors? It was one of the people like me that was in the body that was serving. And he was singing and he was worshiping. And I, I walked in and I said, what are you doing? He's like, I'm doing what I'm doing as an act of worship unto the Lord. People are going to come in and they're going to experience God. I was like, wow, I just experienced God. Because of the reverence and awe. Sometimes people diminish what we're doing. Sometimes a person could diminish, well, you know what, I'm just flicking words on the screen. No, what we're doing is we're setting up other people to have an experience with God as they enter into worship. See, there's a holy reverence and an awe. Everything that we do as a body of believers is important. And Jesus role modeled to us this example. And I want to I wanna grab a hold of that. Everything that I do is important and vital to the body of Christ. Everything that you do is important and vital. And sometimes there, there has been times where we haven't as a church been able to do what we were really could do because there wasn't an involvement in the group or the body that there should have been. But then at other times, because everybody was so involved and so faithful to doing what they were doing is an act of worship unto the Lord. We were able to do and accomplish so much. I want to ask that you would turn with me to John chapter 13. I'm not preaching at you guys. I'm preaching with you guys. This is what the Lord says to me very often. There are no big eyes or little U's in the kingdom. There is no, uh, people see things through position. They see them through flow charts. They see them through, well, okay, this person is the, the leader, so everybody, that's not the way that Jesus led. Jesus led as a servant. There's one job description in the kingdom of God. It is servant. We're all dust. There's nobody, even the people that are out there, even people that live at Port Royal that have millions and millions of dollars, I look at them and if they don't have Jesus, I think, oh my God, they're so poor, all they have is money. God has made us rich in Him. 
And you know what? There, there's a, the, he wants to give us even natural things, but not for the purpose of just having natural things, so that we can seek and save the lost. And I say this to you too. This is what the Lord says. I'm not. Don't. He says, if we're not faithful with what we got right now, why would I give you more? When we become faithful with what He's given to us now, I heard that first message and. I, I, I didn't even have much. I was going through a Bible discipleship school and somebody blessed me with a very small amount of money for Christmas. And I was excited to bring my tithe. Did my tithe make a difference to the church? No, it didn't matter because it was less than $100 at that time. But I sowed it faithfully unto the Lord and the Lord has brought increase and he will continue to bring increase because you know what? When we do everything with a wholehearted devotion, watch out devil. Satan will move out of your way. When we do what we can with the little God has given to us, God will give us more. That's, that, that's, that's him saying it to us. Uh, this is the example that Jesus set for us. Discipleship. He said, this, uh, the, how did he change the world? How did Jesus change the world? He changed the world through discipleship. Jesus didn't change the world by gathering 40,000 people in a stadium and tell, you know, be everybody leaving impressed with how wonderful of a speaker he was. Jesus didn't change the world by developing a name just for himself. Think about that. As preachers of the gospel, Paul didn't uh, uh, make a name for himself. He always pointed towards Jesus. This is what I say to every preacher of the gospel. If people leave impressed with you, you failed. They have to be impressed with King Jesus. See, every man of God or every woman of God is anointed as you might think that they are. You know what? They're but dust. They're frail. They're weak. The beautiful thing is that God uses the weak and the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Now, I'm not saying we should treat people with disrespect. I'm not saying we should dishonor those people. But we have to recognize also that we're all weak and foolish and things of this world. Frail, but dust, but God can add into us his vessels, his glory, so that you can do and accomplish his works. I want you to know this, as we, as we serve, I want you to forget about what you've heard in the past. I want you to wash away some of those things, that those preconceived notions and ideas that we have, because we're all servants. A leader in the body of Christ is a servant. His job may be different, but his job is to serve in a different way so that other, and really to set other people up for success. So that they can grow stronger, that they can go faster, further, faster. That's what Jesus did. He served as an example. As I shared with you that story, I know some people that as, as in religion, that they would never think of cleaning the bathroom. But you know what? I, that's exactly what Jesus did. He did the most menial of tasks because he never asked somebody to do something that he was unwilling to do. That's the role model for leadership that I see in the scripture. That's the role model that our pastors strive for. That's what we strive for. In John chapter 13, verse 11, what did Jesus do? Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. In John chapter 13, verse 11, it says he served the one who was going or to betray him in John chapter 13, verse 11. Here, let me give you a picture before this. We all know about Jesus' foot washing. Washing the feet of, feet of the disciple, not feet. <laughs> he washed the feet of the disciples. You know that that was the most menial of menial tasks. The, they had slippers or flip-flops or whatever you want to imagine them as, but they're like open-toed shoes. They're walking on the paths. They're not walking like Bonita Beach Road or Imperial or Immokalee Road or a Pine Ridge where the, there's concrete and pavement. No, their roads were filled with camel dung. I noticed this when I was upstate. I was like, oh, you know what? I'm from the city and I was watching the horse and I was, we were on this horse trail and I was like thinking, oh my God, the horse is just walking on the trail and it's just like let, doing what it's doing what it does. And the next horse is walking through it. And I was thinking, this is kind of gross. But that's what the roads were full of. 
The most menial of menial tasks that was given was to wash somebody's feet when they came from the road. It was not legal for a free man to do it. Only slaves would, were given the task of washing other people's feet. Catch it. Did you catch that? Jesus was, that was like the, the lowest of the low of the low tasks to be done. But Jesus went and he did it. In John chapter 13, verse 11, it says he didn't just do it for his prime guy, who Peter, who he knew was loyal and faithful to him. Yes, he made a mistake, but Peter was extremely loyal and faithful to him. Every time that there's a name listed in the Bible about somebody, uh, when, they're, when they list the apostles, that they're, they're, Peter's name is there first. Why? Because Peter was one of the, his main guys. Yes, he was super passionate. You know how passionate people are. Sometimes they open their mouth when they shouldn't. You know. Some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. When you're passionate about something, sometimes, you know, it leads you into places where you... But Peter was super passionate. So if you, maybe you're that passionate person. Well, your passion's gotten you in trouble. That's a leadership quality. That's what we look for. We look for somebody who's got passion. We want to see that. Well, Jesus, we're looking for the same thing. But it wasn't just Peter that he washed his feet. It wasn't James and John, the Boanerges, that were so faithful that they got offended when Jesus was disrespected in the, the town that he went to. And they said, in their flesh, rain down fire. It wasn't just Peter, James, and John. Did you know that Jesus washed Judas's feet? Think about that. He washed his betrayer's feet. That's the love of God. The love of God is such that you will that a person that Jesus would wash the feet of the person that he knew was going to betray him. Wow, that's amazing. That's the God kind of walk. That kind of love, that kind of service unto the king is going to be what changes and transforms everything around you. Well, how do I know that? How can I say it with that kind of boldness? Because I've seen it. When we love with that kind of love, when we serve with that kind of love and devotion, people will just see, just like I saw that man in the bathroom. I was thinking, this guy's just cleaning the bathrooms. But you know what he's doing? 20 years later, I'm talking about him. Think about that. The love and the devotion that he had. Every duty that you do and you perform can be an act of worship. We can serve pagans in the marketplace as an act of worship unto the Lord. That they can recognize the way that we serve and they recognize the way that we do things unto the Lord as unto the Lord as an act of worship. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. It says in verse 11 of John chapter 13, Jesus wasn't surprised Judas was going to betray him. He still served him. He still blessed him. And Jesus says later on something that's really important for us. Because some people are like, well, you know what? That's Jesus. That's not me. I said that. I was like, hey, you know what? That's Jesus. That's not me. But I'm a disciple of Jesus. That means I have to change my ways Conform then to the ways of my king, to my master. I don't have a right to live my life the way that I want. Or my flesh would tell me, I have to live it according to that word. Now, I know some of you are like, well, you know, that's kind of tough. That's kind of challenging. But that's all, what it says all throughout scripture. And especially at the end of the verses I'm going to read. So in verse 14, it says, if you then, Lord, and master, have washed your feet also, he says, we also should wash one another's feet, to serve one another, to care for one another. The Bible says this, is that they're going to recognize us by our love for one another. How can we love the world if we can't love one another? We got to love one another. That means that there's going to be times where you get rubbed the wrong way, and you're going to have to go to your brother and your sister. We're going to have to recognize that there's an enemy and it's not one another. And yeah, we're doing that, but I believe that God wants us to do that even more. As new people come, what are they seeing from us? Are they seeing love and care and concern and devotion? I believe that they are. I believe that they are, but we want to be conscious of it. We want to be conscious to continue to convey these things. We want to be very mindful of our testimony as we walk throughout the marketplace, and we come into contact with people that we're a representation of Jesus. And that means something. 
53% of people I just heard recently will, uh, that we in the, in the community won't enter into a church. Now in business, if, uh, you guys know some business people, uh, and you know some Christian businessmen, so I don't want to get this messed up. But it, it is, it is a, a, let's say, a, a, a person who is involved in business, if they know of a demographic that has 53% of people that are untapped for their business, they're going to go after that, aren't they? They're like, man, I'm going to go after that. Uh, that's the exact, well, it, this, is what the, this is what somebody just recently said in the video, and I thought it was so profound, it like hit me like a ton of bricks. He prayed, I pray that the church would love souls as much as businessmen love money. I was like, ow. Oh my God. Because you know, if it was about money, it's a, lot of, a lot of people who are all have the lust of money and the lust of the things of this world, they'll be all over that 53%. How can we reach them? How can we get that? And there'll be meetings, there'll be charts, there'll be all kinds of strategies and plans and and that's, that's my prayer, that we, you know, and we, we, may, some of us might be there. But then there's others of us that we have to challenge ourselves and ask the Lord, Lord, give me a burden. Give me a burden that I don't get caught up in the things of this world. Give me a burden that I don't forget that there's people around me that are going on their way to hell. Let's not listen to our five senses. Let's follow the example that Jesus had. And you know what? Jesus did whatever it took to reach the people. So as he... As he goes on in that verse, it says that he's, he washed the feet of the disciple. Let's go on to verse 17. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Jesus told me, he's like, you want, you want, you know, I know there's a book, Your Best Life Now. And that's a saying that was stole from somebody, you know, a long time ago. But you know what? If you really want to live your best life, it's past the cross. That's your best life. I tried to live life for myself. People told me if you make a lot of money, you'd be happy. I tried to make, I mean, it did make a lot of money. It didn't make me happy. I was like, man, this paper with ink on it, it really just, it, it doesn't make anybody happy. There's a lot of miserable people that have a lot of paper with ink. It's ink and paper. People place such value on it, they'll sell out their families for ink and paper. It's ridiculous. There's other people that say, well, you know what, I want to, I want to, get a trophy or an award and all of those different things. Well, when you get those trophies and those awards and you excel in areas, this is what ends up happening in them. It's sad, some of them. Maybe not as many as you guys. But I had a bunch of different trophies and awards and I had things, you know what ends up happening? They get shoved into a drawer and they get forgotten. And then the trophies, they go into the garage and they just get in the way and then you gotta store more junk and all of these different things. And I found out, you know, it's purposeless. All living for man's approval is even worse. Because you know what? If you're living for man's approval, you're always going to be on a roller coaster ride. You know, you'll be a hero one day and a zero the next day. Just say no. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. But there's one thing, and we'll be happy if we do this. I have the most joy that I've ever had in my life by serving the Lord. I think about this sometimes, and I tell people make sure that you, you're called to be a pastor. And yeah, there's trials and there's difficulties. But you know what? This is, this is my attitude. And I remind myself of this every day as a servant. I get to serve God. I get to serve with the people that I love. I love you guys. I get to hang out with people I love. There's some people that go to work and they don't even like the people that they're with. And I get to tell people about Jesus all day long. Oh my gosh. So, and we, we need to look at the blessing that we have. And this is the truth. Somebody wants what you have. Did you know that? Somebody wants what you have. And we have to be grateful for what God has given to us because you know what? If you're not grateful for it, you won't honor it and you know you might lose it one day. So that you can come back to the place where you're being thankful and grateful for the things that God has placed into your life. In verse 18, I didn't have that on the PowerPoint. Let's go to Luke, uh, John chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus did, what did Jesus do all of that for? Did the Son of God really need to wash anybody's feet? Did the Son of God really need to? I mean, I'm sure he could have been like, poof, their feet are clean. <laughs> in verse 18, he did this. He says, I speak, in verse 17, it says, if you do these things, happy are if you do them. I speak not unto you all. I know I have chosen, 
But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me lifted up his head and his heel. Now I tell you because I have done this to be an example unto you. I've done this to be an example unto you. What verse is he talking about there? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, let's go there quickly too as well. Jesus says that he, does, he did all these things to be an example to us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. First person that can read it. Nice and loud. I challenge you guys. For it has been called for this purpose which Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to be a follower of his death. Read that last verse again, brother. For it has been called for this purpose which Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. Jesus did it so we, his disciples, would follow in his steps. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, it tells us that any person who's following after their master, when they fully mature, they'll look just like their master. We'll be doing the things that he was. You want to know who is the greatest in the kingdom? Because this is, this is what I want to be. I want you to be. I want you to be great in his kingdom. Greatness is not, when we hear the word greatness, it's not the way that the world says it. It's not somebody telling them, hey, you do this. You know, it's somebody who is, and again, Jesus will define it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20, 20, verse 26 to 28. This is my Lord. This is my Savior. This is my King, properly represented. He's a, he's a servant. Even when he comes back in victory and he's coming back in revelations with a sword in his mouth and fire in his eyes. Why? He's coming as, a, as the servant. He's coming back to, to set us free. It's all about being a blessing to other people. This is the way that we're called to recognize greatness in the kingdom. The greatness in the kingdom is not measured by the accoutrements of the world. It's not met, measured by the status quos of the world. It's measured by the standard that Jesus has. Even people as disciples, we need to know that when Jesus said something was good, it wasn't in comparison to the world. It was in comparison to his obedience to his word. That's how he measured goodness. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, it says, But it shall not be so among you. Whoever will be great among you, whoever will be great among you, whoever will be great. So God didn't call you to be mediocre. You know, sometimes, you know what mediocre means? Does anybody want to be, hey, well, you know, when I grow up, I want to be mediocre. Did anybody say that? <laughs> Did anybody say, hey, I want to be average and mundane? No, you want to be great. Well, this is greatness. This is the right measure, the right litmus, litmus test, the, the right acid test. This is the right uh, measure for us to align ourselves with. The king says it right there. These are the people who will be great in the kingdom. It says, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Minister isn't a guy with a funny collar. Minister is a servant. That's what the Bible says. It says it, it, the definition of a minister is a servant. And whosoever will be chief, whoever's going to be the best, whoever's going to be the greatest, let him be your servant. Even the Son of Man, even Jesus, didn't come to be served. He came to serve, to minister, to give his life for a ransom. And now, I have this circled in my Bible for many. And that's for us as disciples. You're going to lay your life down for people. There are going to be some Judases, and you will get stabbed in the back. I told Honorio in the post, if you're going to walk in this God kind of love, somebody's going to stab you in the back at some point. Hey, they did it to Jesus. What makes you any different than Jesus? But do it anyway. Do it anyway. But you know what? Be, let's be wise about it. God may want to set up some boundaries, and he may want us to be a little bit wiser about the way that we do things, but he never wants us to change our heart. He always wants us to do what we do out of love and devotion to him. He'll, uh, and he'll allow some of those things that we go through so that other people can experience the goodness of God and that it can lead them to repentance. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Can you wash Judas' feet? Can you wash your Judas' feet? Can you love the person? Well, if that's the goal for a disciple is that we can walk in love towards those people that are not walking in love towards us. 
so that one day they can be changed and transformed. Abraham Lincoln was a wonderful example. The way that that man learned to read was he re would learn to read by reading the Bible. During a, a presidential election, he ran against somebody, and that was a very vicious uh, election. But when he was elected president, he chose the, op the opponent. And he said that this man is the most qualified for this job. He said, I want him to serve in my administration. Eventually, that man was won over by the Abraham Lincoln's character and his integrity. And by he saw that Abraham Lincoln was the real deal. He became one of Abraham Lincoln's greatest proponents and constituents. That's what the love of God will do. That's, that's what you and I are following after in that example. Our love, our service, our forgiveness will reach other people. That's what God has called you and I to. So to serve them, to help them to reach their fullest potential. And it's not just saying, yes, it's going to be your way. No, it's going to be his way. It's going to be his way. We want, sometimes we're going to have to serve a brother and go to them and say, hey, listen, you're better than this. You need to rise to this. You need to gain everything that you gain. You, sometimes you need to listen to the people that are around you as young disciples come in, especially this younger generation. I'm, I'm calling out and crying out for the young, younger generation. I sat in a pastor's meeting the other day, two of them this past month. I looked around the room, and there's nothing wrong with gray hair. I got a bunch of them. But I said, my God, everybody's gray. Where's the younger generation? I say this, too, and, I, and us included in this. There's something wrong with a leadership that can't raise up uh, the next generation. <clears throat> successful leadership is going to have successful young leaders coming up behind them. You're not a success, I used to hear all the time, until you have a successor. Who is it that's following after us? There are too many people that are insecure, and instead of serving the people that are around them, what they're doing is, is I don't want everybody to know all the secrets because you know what? They might get my job. I say, hey, man, take my job because they all move on to other things. That's, that's the way of the kingdom is that we lift one another up. And we edify one another. We help one another up. There are too many people that are operating like Saul when God is calling the church to operate like David, to lift other people up and encourage them and show them the way by serving them and helping them and equipping them. Where will the church be in 40 years if we don't raise up the next generation? What's this going to require of us? Is there anybody that's over 50? Let's say over 45. Is there anybody that's over 45? If you're a lady, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I don't want to get beat up after service. <laughs> How many of you are between 30 and 45? All right, that's a few. We got to reach them. Our goal is now to equip this generation so that they can have the zeal and uh, the wisdom of the generations that came before and the zeal and the strength that they have. And now you have a powerful force to be reckoned with. Jesus also said this would be great, too. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. You want to be great? Serve. You want to be great? It says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. And it's not my opinion. This is what the Lord said. He said, do and teach. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so. He shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So a person who teaches other people to break the commandments and break, uh, follow after them, hey, there's a lot of bad examples out there. Hey, but we don't have to, you know, that we, we can be a good example. A thousand can fall at our left, ten thousand are on our right, but let's, let's focus on our sphere of influence. Whosoever shall do and teach them the commandments, the word, that means doing the word and then teaching other people the word. They, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of God. Now this is again, Jesus is our example in Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former treaties I leave, I make, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began. I read over this. I used to think it was just a salutation. He began to do and teach. Here, here is in this church, this is our vision. Our vision is this is that the fivefold gifting would be sharing from the pulpit. The apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and evangelist. A, a 
a church that has all five of them, it has all five senses fully functioning. Uh, in the body of Christ, there's apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. You need to exercise your gifts so that you can grow stronger. Serving is growing stronger. Serving is going to, as we serve, we're going to serve and we're going to exercise our gifts and we're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And God has called many of you to greatness, all of you to greatness. The way that great, the great, any great thing was accomplished was always through a whole bunch of little things being done. I'm, I'm excited. This is what we want to see happen in this church. We want to see people raised up, taken out of darkness, trained up in the things of righteousness so that they can walk and that they can continue to fulfill the mission that God has placed upon their lives. We want to see churches be planted. You know, there is no lack for the need of good leadership. We need more strong people. We need more strong disciples to be life group leaders. Can you imagine this life group leaders all over uh, Naples and Benita and Fort Myers and people that, are, and what a life group leader really is, is that he's caring for a small group. He's pastoring a small group. That's what a life group leader is. It's not just somebody who's just gathering together, but seeing that they're in, being entrusted with some of God's flock. We want to see the youth come in in November. I'm believing that on November 4th that we can have the youth lead a service. Why not? Why can't the youth lead a service on November 4th? That we would train them to take the offering. That we would train them to deliver a message. That we would train them to lead the worship. Let's get the youth. You know why? Because Satan's after your youth. Satan's after the younger generation. And, and if they don't have an experience with God, they don't start getting engaged with the church, guess what? The world's going to get them. And I don't want to talk about the problem. I want to be part of the solution. So we need to serve these people that are around us to help them to get better. Why? So that the whole body can be stronger. Each fitly joined together. This thing that God wants us to do can't be done by just us. You can't do it. If you can do it alone, your vision is too small. You're thinking small time. It's always a God-sized vision when we have to get other people involved. Ezra did it. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, it says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach it in Israel's statutes. This is a direction for some of us to be faithful. I hear this all the time. All the time. And my wife may get mad at me later on, and it's okay. I, I just got to do it. Everybody always tells me, oh, I want to hear Jill speak. Oh, I want to hear her talk. Well, she's speaking on September 26th. You know, and this is me, just this family. You have your opportunity, so shut up. <laughs> and love, be quiet. If you don't show up, don't ask no more. But you know what? There's other people that need, we need to invite people to. We need to, I want to encourage you, ladies, invite somebody. You're a person of influence. You have friends, bring somebody so that they can hear that the word. We value it. We're in this together. Invite somebody. Use your influence. But and as you use your influence, it says there in Luke chapter 19, it says, as we're favored with the little, God will give you more. I love you guys. But I, I would say this. I say this to the people I love the most. You know me. John's been in leadership meetings. Don't ask for more if you're not going to be using what you got. The Lord is the same way. I learned it from Him. Use what you have where you are right now, and God will increase it. I give you a mandate. Some of you could be like, eh, you know what, I'm going to ignore what pastor is saying. Eh, people do. It's okay. I'm not going to take it personally. I'm going to still say it. Use your influence. Invite people to come on September 26th. Invite them to come. And you know what? You'll be surprised at the people that come. If you, if you want to hear Jill speak, well, that's September 26th, there. And then please don't ask me on October 4th, hey, when is Jill going to speak? You missed your chance. We all are thinking, you guys are okay? You know, forgive me for being a little bit, because, you know, that's, I always get it. Like, people ask and ask, and this is the opportunity. This is the season. This is the time. So, family, let us bow our heads with a word of prayer. As you can tell, I, I don't want to play church no more. Not that I ever was, but I'm sick. I, I don't, I, there's a mission. It's not to sing songs, and it's not to dance, and it's not to eat a bunch of food, and it's not, no, no, there's a mission. Those things are great, we can do them, and we should do them as an act of worship unto the Lord. But there's a mission to seek and save the lost, 
my heart is burning. And there are some people that are going to leave the church because they want their ears tickled. There are other, and there's going to be other people that will come to the church because they're going to say, hey, you know what? I want to be attached to this mission because it's life and death out there. And I want, to, I want to see the people that want to be involved and be engaged and be the army of the Lord. Not just sing it. I'm sick and tired of singing it. We're the army of the Lord and we're not really doing anything. Hey, listen, I'm not here to tickle anybody's ears. I, I, this past month, there was like nine or ten people. They're not with us no more. It's not a game. We need to get strong in the Lord. We need, they're, they're, we're talking about tough times coming. We need to get strong in the Lord. Some people's houses are getting rocked right now. Well, what, what's going to happen when real things come? This is nothing compared to what's coming. So get ready. Get ready. Be prepared for you, for your family. It's that important. Me, I'm going. I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to make sure that, that the people, as much as that are around me, will be prepared. Is that you? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. If that's you, stick around because the best times are ahead. Great glory is going to be brought to the king. And the way the great glory is going to be brought to the king is that there is going to be a great victory. And great victories only come when there's a battle. But God's going to fully equip us for it. When the attacks come, like California, and people say, hey, you know what? I'm going to arrest everybody that goes to church. Will we show up? When things are like China, maybe they will be. Will we? Just band together? I'm going to call it the way it is. The first ones in the fire in Revelation will be the cowards. I don't want to be the coward. I want to rise up with boldness and trust in my king. And he's going to take, me, take good care of me in awe and reverence of, of him. And I know that he'll take good care of us. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. As a, as a group, as a body of, uh, of people, we're not playing games, Lord. Father, Christianity to us is not a hobby. It's not about going there to a building for a couple hours, Lord. And, Father, then leaving it the rest of the week. Lord, this is who we are. This is who we are, Lord. We're, we're followers of Jesus. We're disciples. Lord, we're not everybody's cup of tea, Lord, because we know in the end times there's going to be a great falling away, Lord. But, Father, for us, we signed on the dotted line. We read the love letter that you made to us, Lord, and we're dedicating our lives to you, Lord. I declare over the members of this body, Lord, that there wouldn't be one that goes AWOL absent without leave, Lord, but every person, Lord, would fulfill the duty and occupy the territory that they've been called to, Lord, for your glory, for your honor, Lord. Father, we declare very quickly, very soon, Lord, that the enemy's territory would be taken back, that he would be stripped of his illegal authority and put in his rightful place underneath our feet, Lord. There's a righteous anger rising up within your people where we say, no more, no more. Rise up an army of servants willing to serve and to do the menial things and the low things, Lord, so that you can do the great things. Lord, we give you honor, we give you praise, Lord, and let this family know how much we love them, how loved that they are by you, and Lord, that you have them well taken care of. We're excited about the times to come because you're going to show up and show out. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Greg, give him a praise offering. He's faithful.